So I'm in the process of redoing my earthen floor, but today I have a video about an earth ship that I visited last winter. It's like no earth ship you've ever seen, and I got to interview the builder, so he explains a lot of the systems that the house has for self-sufficiency. It's incredible. You're going to want to stick around through the whole thing. hardcore sustainable and I am in Taos, New Mexico right now with an earth ship behind me. No, I'm not actually. You can see there's like, well, you actually can't really see the tropical, but you can see trees everywhere. So anyways, we're not in Taos. Um, we're south of St. Petersburg, Florida, maybe like an hour. So we're in sort of the palmetto and cabbage palm forests here. And this is, I think, Florida's first and only earth ship. Usually you think of our earth ships as being in the desert, and this one is being adapted to the climate here. Different conditions, a lot more rain, um, hot, humid conditions, and we're going to see how they've set this up and adapted it to Florida's climate to make use of those um, things that normally might be climate liabilities and weather liabilities that are now going to be advantages here. You know, this is a project that he's been putting a lot of time and energy, but this is like trying to get it done. <laughs> well, you know, yesterday was my 13 year anniversary. Okay. With, uh, with Earthships. With Earthships. Yeah. And, uh, we, you know, they say, there's that book, I think it's called 10,000 Hours to Be an Expert. Uh -huh. It might have a different title. I got 27,000 hours in on this job. I think I mean, you're an expert. I think I got this. <laughs> I can handle this. <laughs> Hello, my name is Ron Chirello. I'm from Taos, New Mexico. I've worked for the world headquarters with Earthships for the last 13 years. Yesterday was my 13 year anniversary. Wow. I'm with Pangea Builders, which is the son of the founder of Earthships. Uh, this is a project that started about 12 years ago. Uh, the owners have been very anxious to get it finished. So they sent me here for the month of February to run a workshop. I've had volunteers from uh, all over the United States and also some people from Germany. So it's been kind of a training process, the trade for their labor, for the experience and the knowledge and education that we provide with these buildings. Uh, we've been moving forward really, really well on the building. The building, Earthships um, use six principles. Um, one of which is uh, uh, renewable energies. So this system is because it's sunny Florida. It's all it's on solar, uh, solar power and solar hot water. So that's kind of like one of the main things we've been focusing on is trying to get the electricity, the blood moving through the veins for the building. Uh, another thing that Earthships uses passive solar, and that's for heating and cooling the building. Mm -hmm. And so that gets a little technical because it uses laws of physics and thermal dynamics when you're using solar gain. This building doesn't require any solar gain. There's only a handful of days in the year where you, know, you might get a little chilly. Yeah, yeah, so you don't cool. want to heat the building it up. Yeah. You don't really need to. In fact, it's just the opposite. But that's what you want. You want to charge the mass with cold air. And so when it's 95, 100, 105, the mass of the building is storing that cold air. Yeah. Now the building also uses convection air. All newer ships are using convection air and have been now for 10, or 10 years or so. What that is, is that's 30 foot cooling tubes and we use 10 inch gal galvanized culverts. It's the same thing you find underneath the roads all over the world. So they're readily available. They're super strong. You can drive on them. We drive backhoes over them once they're kind of buried into the earth and they bring, come in through the back of the walls. Then with the skylights, you can kind of see them up there. What the skylights are doing, um, combination of things the skylights do, they provide natural light into the space. Uh, but most importantly, what they do is they allow the heat to escape uh, throughout the building. So because heat rises, what that does is heat's naturally rising, so it's rising up into the domes, and then the skylights open, and that releases that pressure, all that hot air pressure. Mm -hmm. And so that creates a convection heat engine, essentially. So while that heat is rising, it's also sucking air down through the vent tubes. Well, when you're coming through 30 feet of galvanized metal, which is conductive, 
and you're underneath that burial, that earth, you've got several feet, you know, maybe 10, 15 feet, depending on, you know, how tall the building. And in this case, it's, it's a large building. So it's got a lot of earth on top of those tubes. And so that's allowing that hot air from outside to come through the tube and cool down. And then, so that cold air is being drawn by that hot air that's pushing up. So that's a convection air system that happens every day, all day, free. Um, again, this is a hurricane superstructure. So it is built with, um, there's about 12 courses of tires. Uh, each tire weighs approximately 300 pounds. We hand, we hand pounded all those. They're stacked up vertically and then reinforced steel vaults are locked down into them. So we drive steel down into them, painted steel, and then we build these cages on top of them. And then that's a ferro cement vault. So that means it's just essentially a superstructure. Mm -hmm. And that's great for hurricane prone areas, tornadoes. These things laugh at those storms. I mean, they're literally not affected in so. any yeah. way. So we built the whole building with these powerful tire bricks. And so now it, it serves two purposes. It handles you know, everything that can th get thrown at it with the weather, but also it's all about the performance of the building. So when you're bringing in that cool air during in, through the tubes, it's charging those large mass walls and the floors. So there's the laws of physics and thermodynamics working. Mm -hmm. So as the temperature of the air maybe rises or falls, then the temperature that's stored in the mass of the walls and the floors equalizes it. Mm -hmm. So airships are always striving for 70 degrees all day, all night, all year round, no matter what Mother Nature is providing. The goal here in Florida is all about keeping it dry and keeping it cool. And those are monumental challenges. Everybody on the grid has HVAC systems, so they don't care. Yeah. They're not worried about it. You know, they turn a thermostat up or down and they get what they want. So this is going to be off-grid, not grid-tied at all? It's off-grid. Okay. Yeah, there's no power, water, sewage, nothing's tied into this building. Okay. You can, um, and that's what the owner is actually thinking now is we will grid-tie. The only reason we would want to grid-tie is because we have so much electricity to give yeah. or sell. Why wouldn't he? Yeah. So, you know, the grid's right there. It's not a big expense to get the lines in here and then to set up our renewable systems to charge the grid. It's definitely an advantage to doing that. The other thing this building is now doing for the first time in over 10 years is it's catching its rainwater. Uh, the roof is now designed in such a way that the rainwater will hit it. It channels all the way through off the domes, through the framing, into the gutters, into these scuppers, and down and, and then through these, uh, what we call a canali, which is a, a filtering basket. Because here you got issues with leaves and, and acid rain and everything else that, you know, being washed with the rain. So we kind of, we're designing this building to be a little different than Earthships and Taos. Uh, we have a Jandy valve that we can change the direction of the rainwater away from the cisterns. So that means that it can wash off the roof. So the first couple minutes of, of heavy rain will rinse the roof, rinse the air, and then that gets kind of washed down into the soil. And then you can change the direction of the valve. That water comes into the cisterns, and those are your holding tanks that are buried. Mm -hmm. So because they're all buried, they're controlled, that have a controlled water temperature. So these are sealed in the, in the earth. They're gonna be insulated and buried under more earth. There's still a little bit of rainwater work I have to do when I get back in May. So the rainwater will come into the building, we'll pump pressurize and filter it. And the filtering system is designed for this climate. Um, it does have an interior atrium greenhouse, and the idea there is because of the hurricane season or even just the heavy rain seasons, it pretty much washes out crops. So we're protecting food. So we're dealing with food uh, inside the building and outside of the building. So that's a big, big deal. This is a 10 acre organic farm. Um, it's the idea here is to sustain life for a large family, not a family of four. This uh, will produce food inside, outside livestock and aquaponics as well. Mm -hmm. So, and they have, as long as he has at least an acre, which he has 10 of them, we can move heavily into permaculture with this property as well. One more principle that we address is building with natural and recycled materials. Mm -hmm. Here we're using pretty much uh, recycled material. So used automobile tires is the primary building material that we use. We've been able to get very aggressive with recycled materials, but we haven't really been able to do much with natural. Natural doesn't work when you have, you know, 150 mile an hour winds and 
massive rainstorms and you're in the middle of the jungle and you've got humidity just dr draining off the walls. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it has to be some form of cement. Now there's a lot of guys out there playing with hempcrete, aircrete, papercrete. It's, it's all still Portland based, mm -hmm. but they're minimizing it. They're trying to reduce it. For me, I'm interested in a building that's going to last centuries, not decades. Here you've got mostly just earth as this berm, and then you've got the retaining walls of tires, and is that um, like concrete packed in there, or is that also earth that's packed in? All the tires, tires are filled with dirt. Okay. So, you know, again, in, indigenous to the site. Mm -hmm. So if we can get you know, straw from the site, if we, you know, dirt, of course, from the site, any other material that Mother Nature provides. And anywhere else, I probably would have done mud or cop. You know, we could have done yeah. like adobe. Right. So in this case, it would have been cop. So it would have been a very strong, like, a, like an adobe brick, same recipe, pack out the tires. So you pound dirt, pack out with dirt, and then you put a, a layer of wire on it. So it's either chicken wire, hardware cloth, lath, whatever it is, stucco netting is what we use in New, in New Mexico. And then put a thin coat of, of a plaster, a stucco or a cement dyed, and now you got it. Now it's sealed. You're not going to have to worry about water, wind, you know, sun, all the key elements that break down a natural product. Mm -hmm. But for us, we couldn't, even, we couldn't even get the dirt dry long enough to make it wet. You yeah. understand what I mean? Yeah. yeah so, if, so there was no adobe on the inside of the walls, which is what we like to do. We prefer playing with clay. All everywhere inside the building, but it just was not an option for us. My last two or three builds have not been carbon neutral, they've been carbon negative. I've been here a month today, and most contractors will put out anywhere from a six yard to a 20 yard container weekly in trash. And so if you've got a project that's going on for months and months, you look at how much waste is coming off of a new construction site. That doesn't happen on these jobs. Not only have we not produced one 55-gallon bag of garbage, but we've actually gone into the field looking for plastic and old cement bags and old glass and anything that was left over from the previous contractors, and we've taken care of that too. So in a month, there's been nothing but additional cleanup. We've left, we literally have left this job site so much better than the way we found it. When you've done the research on the environmental impact of concrete, we start looking at either minimizing it or being more strategic about its placement. So if it's a footing or it's an inspection requirement, of course that has to be concrete and steel. But beyond that, a situation like these tire walls, here's an example where you can eliminate a lot of this. We use a, we obviously use uh, some cement here, but we use like old cement that was laying around on the job site. So we took sledgehammers and we broke it up. We used it for rocks, uh, bottles, cans. So we had to get a little bit creative and try to find some garbage that we could save on cement and the embodied energy involved in doing this. So we did the best we could as, you know, eco gurus, and we are eco gurus. Now, the other thing I want to mention is we treat our own sewage on site, which, as far as I know, nobody in the state of Florida is doing that. The way we do it in Taos is we put a standard conventional septic tank in the ground, we run our plumbing straight into it, then the liquid effluent spills over to the liquid side, and because we shower, well, our shower water is recycled, so all of that water gets put into the toilets, and that's gray water. So the gray water actually assists in the anaerobic process inside of the septic system. The liquid fluid spills over to the one side, then it spills into a bio cell, which is like our gray water systems exactly. It goes through river rock, gravel, sand, straw, soil, plants. All that's doing is thing eating up a lot of the black water. Um, we also, I have been personally um, heavy on recirculating black water, allowing it to create more friction, more flow through the bio cell that's helping process that water a little bit faster. Then the overflow of that goes into your conventional leach field lines. So for us, it's, it's pretty much the same thing. It's just gonna go through a pipe and it's got perforated holes in it all the way down the pipe. That liquid effluent spills out of those pipes down into a large gravel bed. And then the idea of that is it again, it's kind of like filtering it further and then it moves down into the water table. 
There's a lot of things with earth ships, especially in the tropics, that requires people to be here. It's not a building that you want to abandon. Mm -hmm. It's not like, oh, I'm going to go on vacation to Europe for a couple months. I'm just going to close the door. Well, you're going to be pretty unhappy when you come home. Uh, it's like a pet. You know, you can leave a cat for like two or three days. Your dog's not going to make it through the first day. In this case, the house is similar. You know, you can, you can lay down a few things, but after a few days, you're going to come home to a pretty stinky situation. Earthships and humans, they need each other. They must live together. I don't build this building as a second home, wealthy person's home. I don't build those houses. It's a living organism. Mm -hmm. It's breathing, it's, it's, it's got life pumping into it. And as that life is pumping, it's pumping life into you. And as you're living in it, you're pumping life into it. The work at the Earthship continues and I'm anxious to see how it's progressing the next time I go to Florida. I hope to make an update video eventually so we can see all the living building Earthship systems in action and the house in a more finished state. I want to thank Ron Chirillo for giving this great interview. If you want more info on Earthships, you can check out the link to PangeaBuilders.com in the description below. Thanks for watching my channel. To subscribe, hit the Hardcore Sustainable logo in the corner of the screen. And don't forget to like the video and share it with your friends. You can also follow me on the Hardcore Sustainable Facebook page for more frequent, inspiring, and informative eco-oriented posts.